Well, good morning and welcome to our family webinar this week, meeting the recorder family of instruments. It gives me huge pleasure to introduce our wonderful recorder, player and flautist with the Brook Street Band, Lisette the Silver Bull. Now, Lisette and I have known each other for, gosh, at least 10 years. We work a lot together, both in concert work and education work. And Lisette has always struck me as being the most wonderful communicator um, of her passion for this wonderful instrument. Many of us will have come across it, perhaps for the first time in primary school. And if you're like me, you probably played it for a few years and didn't continue with it. I know Lisette will come to some of the reasons um, why it, it, it's been a, a maligned instrument in the past um, and, and how we can put this right. But for now, I'd love to hand you over to Lisette de Silverball and her wonderful array of recorders. Welcome, Lisette. Thank you very much, Tati. That's very kind. <laughs> yes, I do love the recorder and um, I love chatting about it. So this is a really good opportunity for me to have an outlet <laughs> to be able to talk about it. Well, as you can see, I've got what I call, like to call little forest of recorders, um, not only because they're made out of wood, um, they're beautiful little works of art. Um, and it'll be a really lovely thing to be able to share that with you. I'll be talking a little bit about the history of the recorder. Um, I'm going to be playing as well um, and also talk about the recorder family for those who don't know perhaps about it normally when we do educational work if we go to schools i normally have lots of lovely um little volunteers to come and hold the recorder so you can see um how the instruments get bigger and and how many i don't have the whole entire family because the tallest recorder in the world who has the very cool name of um, big babe it's over 10 feet tall and I don't own one. <laughs> it wouldn't fit into my little music room anyway. Um, but um, yes, hopefully we'll, we'll go together through a little journey. Now, when you play the recorder, I normally like to say that we are a little bit like um, historical detectives. The moment you start delving into this beautiful instrument, you really realize very quickly that your repertoire spans something like eight, nine hundred years, which is an incredible amount, really. And that as recorder players, what is required of us is a very unique set of skills that's unlike any other instrument. For instance, if you play the piano, normally you play the piano and you even really specialize in a composer or a style Whereas for us, um, when we do historical performance, and certainly in woodwind, in instruments such as like the recorder, it really requires us to have a really wide, broad um, knowledge of history, of instrument making as well. Because I've got models that are modeled on instruments that are five, 600 years old, and some that are brand new too which is really exciting. Um, as recorder players, we are required to also have learned different sets of fingerings for all these instruments to read and transpose as well. So I normally say that we're historical detectives with an ever expanding brain, which is an amazing thing to be able to have. And I think without further ado, I'm very good at talking about and I could really go about it but I, how about I play you something so you can hear the sound <laughs> of the instrument now I'm going to play a little bit of fantasy number one by George Philip Tellerman and I'm going to use my beautiful Denner recorder at Baroque pitch made for me in Australia by this wonderful maker called Winter um, and it's a very appropriate instrument um, to play this and if at any point you have any questions about um, what I'm doing or any instrument that may catch your eye, please do. We are live and that's the brilliant thing of doing this, is that we can. <laughs> now this Telemann Fantasia is part of the set I recorded for this wonderful project and it will be going live tomorrow on our YouTube channel, so do watch out for it.
interrupt. Thank you so much. That was absolutely beautiful. I've just had a question in from Nicola Lowton. Normally we take questions at the end, but the internet glitched just as you mentioned the maker of your recorder. So would you okay. mind just repeating that again? Okay. Hi, Nicola. <laughs> so lovely to see you here. Welcome. Um, this is Michael Grinter. Michael Grinter. Um, and I'd like to do a shout out as to many makers that are living and... Um, you know that are doing such great things we are such wonderful group and very supportive group as recorder players and Nicola is one of such wonderful players so I'm really thrilled that you're here <laughs> brilliant thank you so much Lizette I'm sorry to interrupt you just no, about no, no, back in the... I think it's wonderful that you do please <laughs> fantastic okay so I thought now I would just talk a little bit about um for those who wonder why the recorders had such a malignant um, image, there is a curious bit of history that perhaps a lot of people don't know. Um, and it's quite relevant to where we are um, in, in, as, as far as history. Um, we, are, we are going through a world pandemic, which is the very reason why we're doing this. And uh, the Arts Council is so kindly provided um, funding for us as a group to do this and to keep trying to keep art going and trying to keep people involved and engaged um, because it's one of the things that the world has been really deprived of immediately the moment you can't meet because it's such a social thing it's a wonderful way of communicating with other people and keeping people's mental health bolstered and um, and keep a sense of self and identity as well for so many this is so important and um, after the Second World War, which was a dreadful period in, um, in world history, it, the same thing happened. Um, although the pandemic is not as serious and severe as the World War, obviously. But one of the things that came out of it, it was the thought by governments um, that music was really important and the arts were really important. And that one of the things that had really been missing in children's lives in school was, was just that. And so they found a way of, tr they're trying to find a way of bringing music to as wider public and across sort of, uh, you know, poor and, and wealthier people, but especially to the people who would normally wouldn't have the means um, to buy instruments or have music lessons. They started mass producing recorders in plastic and giving them out to um, primary schools. And this is the very reason why it was a very good thing to do, but it had a, a dreadful side effect, which was to attach the image of the instrument to children um, and with, with people who really weren't um, trained to, to teach it or didn't know very much, although it was a really, really lovely thing. But it meant that this idea of um, squeaky plastic recorders and little recorders um, was born from that and of course that is the furthest thing from truth recorder is not a squeaky instrument for little people um, to go on to a proper instrument recorder is a proper instrument it's on right with one of the longest history historical um journeys of all the instruments with um i don't know sizes that span about 10 different sizes of instruments with music spanning 900 years with really rich cultural history yeah Lisa, i'm so glad you said that because so many people i chat to um believe the recorder to not be a proper instrument and uh, and, and it's i think it's due to i mean i was at school in the 1970s and we have recorder choirs and we we did wonderful things i had a lovely teacher who actually was a professional recording teacher jenny Beck, my classroom teacher um but she was a very good recorder player but, you know, again, it's that squeaky image. And once you start expanding on the history of the instrument, it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, some of the facts you were telling me recently about it, just, I, I mean, would you expand on some of those for us now? Yes, please, if you'd like to tell me. Well, no, the, yeah. the history dating back almost 9,000 years. I mean... Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, it's a really curious thing because I think archaeologists are always, you know, um, doing wonderful work. Um, and every so now and again, they, they, they come across really interesting things. And I think the latest one, I have become a, um, kind of um, aware of, is in China, that really earliest members of the Cordon family were found in a dig 
that is thought to be 9,000 years old. Whether music or all this was an important way of, um, of entertainment, of, you know, downtime or perhaps communication to, to other people. Um, who knows, but it's been there as, as long as man has been around, really. Um, and when I, you know, start teaching recorders, I really love teaching. It's one of my passions. And one of the things I love doing, of course, is explaining how wonderful the recorder is. But one of the things I always do is that um, I always say that caveman <laughs> used to play the recorder. And they did. Um, made, you know, these recorders and this wood instruments, uh, these woodwind instruments made out of bone where they would drill holes. And um, really the instrument never stopped, you know, going. I mean, the earliest sort of models I've got here, I've got about 23 or 22, 24 recorders here, actually. Um, I do own another couple of uh, bigger instruments. I've got a Renaissance bass and a uh, contrabass, but they are on loan at the moment. Um, and if maybe here, they are my, um, what we call Ganassi uh, recorders. And I'll tell you a little bit about um, Ganassi. Um, I mean, they are sort of, a Ganassi recorder is almost like a generic term because these recorders are made to sort of um, look a bit like what would have been around um, at the time. It's very difficult for instruments to survive because they get um, bent and misshapen um, or get lost in fires. These are organic materials. So it's not very often one plays in original recorders, if at all. Some are playable in museums. And in this country, if you go to the Bait Collection in Oxford, you will see some wonderful examples. And actually, I've got one copy of such an instrument, the Stainsby recorder, which is an English model and a beautiful instrument. Um, but anyway, you can see this. This is a desk and or soprano recorder. Um, and this is a treble recorder, but it's a tre treble recording the G. We call it a G alto. These instruments, by the way, made for me by the wonderful Adriana Brunking um, in Holland, who has been responsible for, she's, she's a real, um, she's a really interesting person. She's a wonderful maker, wonderful human being, and she's a very creative spirit. So she's always, she's a great innovator and she is responsible for cross, um, putting its Renaissance and Baroque instruments across. And I've got um, an example here, for instance. This is called the Dream Recorder. And I've got a desk and an alto version of this, which look very much like a Ganassi recorder. Yet they play all the chromatic um, sort of notes of the Baroque recorder. And I will explain what that means is although these instruments, and I don't know if I show a little bit of the bottom bell, how wide it is. And if some of you play the recorder, do have a look um, and see how your instruments may look. Um, and this one is a little bit less, but it's still quite wide. Um, and there's a reason for this, and I will show you, I will, this is my wonderful Van Hoona um, Sainsby recorder. And you can see there's that two trebles, the difference between the ball holes. And the Renaissance one has got a wonderful big sound, but it's more, it has less notes. You have single holes, and I don't know if you can see how wide they are. And if you notice very carefully, you will see that all the holes are different sizes and different positions. And although the recorder may look like a simple system instrument, which is what they, they tend to be called, there's nothing simple about it. It's an absolute feat of engineering brilliance what makers have to do and how they work from historical blueprints um, and designs to be able to, to create this. It's just works of a wonder, really. But if I play you, for instance, the bottom register on this instrument. Wonderful, warm, rich.
pitch sound, but it lacks. Yes. Sorry, can I ask? So you, that 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 um, Ganassi copy is is a copy of a Renaissance instrument. Yes. So we're talking roughly five hundred years ago. These yes, five things... hundred years ago. And I'll tell you what Ganassi, who Ganassi was. Ganassi, his full name is Silvestro Ganassi, and he published a really um, important book in fifteen thirty five in Venice called La Fontegara. And La Fontegara is one of my favourite books of all time, and I'll tell you why because this is one of the very rare instances where you see a tutor book um, on how to improvise in the recorder. It's the things he does in that book are so mind-bendingly clever, but it's made for professional players. So we know there were professional players and just recorder players at the time. And one thing he says in this book, is so profoundly beautiful and he says that the, he is saying in 1535 the recorder is such a wonderful instrument in fact it's one of the most beautiful instruments and the reason for that being is one of the closest instruments to the human voice and because human voice then you're connecting to the human spirit and so when you're playing you're singing and I think that's just so beautiful. And you can hear it in, um, in this recorder. So look up for Silvestro Ganassi. He's one of our recorder team hearers, really. He's a rather fabulous. Could we hear a little bit of, of that recorder? We certainly can. Actually, I've got... Um, it's so, so tempting to see such a vast array of them. And I, I'm wondering how they all sound. It's... Yes, yes. Well, there's this piece here called, um, I haven't played for years, but called Cominciamento di Gioia, which means the beginning of joy. But I think it's lovely, and I think it is a joyous thing to play the recorder. Now, I'm going to play just a little excerpt from it. Um, I may do a couple of really curious things, and I'll see if you can notice, and then we can talk about it. This is a medieval piece from the medieval collection of dances. Um, so this is even older. This is roughly 800 years ago. Yeah, yeah, 1300. This is music of the Trecento, what we call Trecento, which is the 1300s, basically. So it's, this instrument is very cool. This is, this is, we are a TARDIS. We are historical detectives, and here we go. I mean, uh, and I can assure you, I don't think it was the internet glitching. There are some <laughs> no, wonderful it, sounds. Well, it isn't the internet glitching. What I did is what we call extended techniques. Now, another thing about this, this instrument, because it's so pure and so rich, um, rich in, in sound, that you can do really, really cool things with it. And one of the things that we think is extended techniques being part of the modern language repertoire really is things like Zing und Spiel, which is singing as you play, because you can make your own drone, okay? You can do slap tongue, for instance, you can slide. There's many, many more. So if I start taking the recorder part, you'll see. I'll see how much time there is in today because we've got two other sessions. I could talk about this for day. <laughs> it's amazing, actually. It brings me just a quick question, actually, because I'm wondering um, some of those techniques. When you just made the slide, then it made it sounded like a kind of penny whistle where you. Yes. Can you actually explain how the sound is made? For, for those of us that are not recorder players, because one hundred percent, absolutely. Well, it's actually quite a simple thing, and funny you say a penny whistle because I do have a um, slide whistle here that belongs to my lovely children. I thought, I mean, I don't want to cheapen this in any way, but it's a really good way of explaining. Um, 
the recorder in its um, sort of simplest form, in a way it can be likened to organ pipes as well, because you've got different sizes. And basically the principle of it is the longer the pipe is, the lower the sound, by the way. So the way it's sound is made is very, very simple. I don't know if you can see, but this, there's a little slit there where you blow down. Okay, and this will vary. The shape of these will vary from maker to maker, from design to design. There's so many different types of recorders. And if you can see the wind way here, there's a little ledger over there. And the principle is really simple. When I blow down, the air goes down the tube and that's split into two. And when it gets split into two, that's what makes the sound. So if I just blow, that's how you make sound. But if I put my hand across, and so you've got pitched sound, it's white noise. And what most people don't actually realize, and why would they realize, <laughs> is that um, the air, on the recorder actually comes out of here it doesn't come out of there some escapes and comes out but actually everything the magic bit is really done here this is the most important thing which is why when it comes to recorder care you always have to be so very careful now if i show you this beginning bit again this top bit you can see there's a darker wood here and a, and a sort of a lighter wood. It's because the block, this is why, um, what is it called? It's called the block of the recorder. And that will be, don't forget, to why the recorder is called recorder and what, the, what its name means um, in different parts of the world. Um, it's made out of softer, more elastic wood. When you blow down, you warm up the instrument. And when you warm up the instrument, this bit here expands because anything that gets hot, it's a bit of science, isn't it? Um, expands. And when it cools down, it contracts. So this bit of wood needs to be more elastic. You've got to have a, a, elasticity. Um, and so when you're caring for it, you should never oil because with wooden recorders, you have to, you know, they're not, you can just be like pet, precious pets. And you've got to take really good care with temperature, with humidity. And you have to also oil them, okay, to keep them nice and supple and the wood for, to last. It also improves the sound, but you can never ever oil the block of the recorder because if you do, because it's porous, wood is porous, it will absorb it and it's most likely to crack. And that's your instrument ruined. But yes, yeah, so the recorder actually is a curious name because it's only called the recorder in English speaking countries. Everywhere else is called flute or flute with a beak or sweet flute. Um, and it's called recorder because we think that um, it's to do with theatre music and um, perhaps around the time of restoration um, where there's a lot of uh, recorders used in theatre as you know you didn't have full operas you didn't have you had you know, perhaps plays with, with music and songs. So Lisette, we're talking restoration, roughly Henry Purcell, that's a composer. Yes, that's exactly, yeah, around the that time. Of the 17th, mid to late 17th century. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and perhaps a little bit earlier. I'm not so clear um, on, on the time. I don't think the timing is, is so clear. It's around that time. Okay. Um, recorders have always been used historically as instruments, obviously, with, with solo repertoire, but also as character instruments in operas and, and, and plays. And one of the things they used to do is to use the recorder um, when somebody was asleep or dreaming. So that to re the recorder is linked to recall, to remember, you know. So either pastoral scenes or sleep scenes, and that's why it's called the recorder. For instance, in France, it's flute à bec. In Portugal, where I come from, it's called flauta de bisel. In Brazil, flauta doce, which is such a Brazilian in Portuguese, is such beautiful. Um, it's got such a beautiful sound in my ear. Um, in, in Germany, block flauta, flute with a block. 
and um, in Italian, flauta dolce, sweet flute, in Spanish, flauta de pico. So you, you can see that it's either flute with a beak or sweet flute because of its, <laughs> because of its sound. This is something I guess many of us experimented with. It was interesting here, seeing you take the recorder apart and explain how the sound is made because when, we, when I first started, certainly one of the things we learned to do was make interesting noises represent, representing a particular type of animal on the recorder and it's particularly oh, yes. adept at doing that. I wonder if you could uh, explain. Oh. I'm, I'm just aware of how many wonderful instruments you've got there but we do have two further sessions. We've got a session yes. on the 8th and the 22nd of August as well. Well, I, I know you'll bring your Baroque flutes in as well, Andrew. Andrew yes, Matthews, we've, yes. we've got um, plenty of time. We don't have to do the entire no, family. No. Um, and whoever says that I can't add everything, do come back and, you know, have a conversation. This is a really lovely thing to be able to do um, and to have this resource online as well so that people can tune in of all ages, of all, you know, across the world. It's a really wonderful thing um, to do. What so, I think we'll do is take some questions at the end, actually, if that's yeah. all right. So do, if you've got questions you want to ask, put, I, I shall, um, I, I'm moderating the chat, if you like. So I'll hand the questions over to Lisette, who can then answer them. So I, do, well, do exactly. think of questions. And so, for instance, things you can do, let's see, uh, let me choose. Oh, Here's my lovely voice flute by the wonderful Tim Cranmore. He's a British maker, and I'd like to do a little nod to Tim because he's a lovely man and he makes some wonderful instruments. And I actually spent most of the day, he very kindly let me into his studio where I saw him working on recorders and I spent hours trying instruments so I could <laughs> choose one and this is, this is it. So, um, this is a tenor in D and if I take the top, there's lots of really cool things you can do. Um, let's have a look. So already I, I showed that you can make white noise the wind you can think of it as a tempest or sort of storm you can if you close and what I've added to it is my tongue rolling <laughs> which is another what we call extended um, um, technique what we call we can do ghostly sound you can add some flutter tongue it's just fluttering up the tongue it's just a magic sound world and you can do the slide <laughs> it's brilliant Absolutely I was thinking one very specific thing, but maybe we don't have time today. I don't want to put you on the spot. No, that's the, the recorder being used uh, for bird song. Oh, yes. Oh, most certainly. And across. It's one of the wonderful things that um, it can be used for, for instance, Van Eyck, which is a Dutch um, composer who was um, really composed a um, really important collection of 150 tunes. Um, and religious, some of them religious tunes and popular tunes from across Europe. And um, he made divisions, he made um, on, on them called the Flute's Pleasure Garden. And there's a very curious, that's a whole webinar on the Flute and Lusthof, um, which is the Flute's Pleasure Garden. He was very important. He was a blind recorder player. He was a carillon player um, who devised a really clever way of bell tuning. And um, he was in Holland. And he, for instance, one of the tunes he composed was um, English Nightingale, <laughs> which is really lovely, which is alluding. So maybe perhaps next week I'll play a bit of it um, on my um, Renaissance recorders. Oh, yes, and Vivaldi, Il Gardellino, the Finchcock, for instance. Oh, my goodness, the, the examples are, there's lots of examples. It, it would be wonderful to hear some of those. Uh, I love the fact you mentioned the carillon because that's another sort of much misunderstood instrument. That's basically a keyed, a, a system of bells operated by keys and Handel used the carillon and that caused uh, somebody to write that Mr. Handel had maggots in his head basically because it was such an unusual choice of instruments. I think it was in his oratorio Saul and one of uh, a sort of casual listener was writing a letter to a friend and referred to these maggots in Mr. Handel's head because <laughs> of this interesting instrument. Yeah, there's always one, isn't it? There? There's always one. <laughs> well, 
I, I, think, I love the chance to sort of set the, set the record straight about the recorder because it's such a beautiful and versatile instrument. Oh. And I, I think maybe next week or in a fortnight, we'll come on to some of these because I can see all sorts of different yeah. sizes. I'm oh, yes. guessing from, from knowing what I do about the string family, the bigger the recorder, the deeper the sound. That's it. And this is um, what it's akin to, to organ pipes. But uh, unless, but um, I always say that um, with the recorders, you can really mold and shape the sound. And that's a whole technique, a whole way of doing it. Because I think recorder is one of these instruments that seems very easy to play, but it's actually very difficult to play well. Because your technique has to be so good at controlling the airflow, for instance, um, at your finger technique. Oh, my goodness. There's no key. There's nothing. And so in tuning as well, you have to really be um, very careful with it. There's nowhere to hide, really, is there? Um, if you're very exposed as a recorder play, which gives way to a lot of perhaps not so good um, publicity <laughs> when it's badly played. Oh, Lisa, we've got a couple of questions, actually, if you're happy to take some. Um, no, certainly. I've got one from Nicola. Yeah. What is your favourite period of music to play on the recorder if it's not oh. too hard to choose? No, well, it is. Hi, Nicola. Um, it, is, it is hard. I mean, I, anyone who knows me knows I'm a great... Uh, French Baroque um, music, a lover of French Baroque music. But before, what most, some people may not know, um, is that before, I've had many, many loves in music, and I think that does keep evolving, you know. I used to be really, really passionate about Italian music, about 17th century Italian music. I do love the Baroque repertoire, of course I do, that was wonderful Handel sonatas, wonderful Telemann repertoire. Um, and it's, it's really hard because I think I would, my instinct right now would be to say perhaps French Baroque. Although saying that, there really isn't, apart from one specific piece in the whole of the French repertoire, it's just for recorder, everything else can be played in lots of um, different um, instruments. I've got a, a question actually from Samson here. Um, What's the most unusual recorder you've ever played and what was it made of? Because I'm looking at these behind you and they're, they're, as far as I can see, mostly made of wood. I think the most perhaps unusual have to be sort of earlier um, recorders because I don't tend to play them so much. Um, and they are wooden, made out of wood, pear wood or um, some, I don't know, there's different types of wood that they can be made out of. Another really unusual instrument is the Eagle Recorder, which is again made by Adriana Brunking, because there's now an, a development in recorder making and engineering where they're starting to add keys and experimenting with different wind waves. And I'm, it's not um, something I'm, for me at, at this particular stage, but it were made out of really hard wood and they're supposed to be really loud and strong and potent. And I somehow miss the, the sweetness and the, the gentleness and I quite think like that we can do so much with our fingers if we're really clever and I quite like the idea of really learning to play this one really well and do lots of wonderful things with it rather than add so many things but some people really love it and that's fantastic to them and that's okay. As, as a string player often you know our instruments are traditionally made of wood but you can, electronic versions of a cello are made of you know composite material or, or plastic or and they need amplification it's, it, of course, recorders are made of plastic, that can be made of plastic, we know that. But um, is there such a thing as an electronic recorder or a yes. digital recorder, something yes. that can there's be... there's an e-recorder. Again, there's all these wonderful things. You can plug in recorders to things. Um, I think Mollenhauer does some, um, which is a German make of recorder, does some um, electronic plugins. Again, it's, you know, you can do sound distortion, you can, they come in really snazzy colours, and they have really different design. This is on the sort of modern end of, of instruments. And a lot of people have a lot of fun with electronics. And it can be very, very um, effective on contemporary music. Actually, that's wonderful um, sound world. Yes. Because actually, the, oh, sorry, I've got something. Over, yeah, the recorder is, is it, because it's such a, a evolving instrument, it doesn't ha it, you can't pigeonhole it with repertoire. The repertoire spans from, as you say, medieval right up this plenty of wonderful compositions for the modern day. Oh, um, yeah. I, I have a question actually from, from Liz asking, yeah. what age would you recommend a child starts to study the recorder? That's a very good, hi Liz. <laughs> it's a very good question. I think it depends on the size of the child and um, 
the sort of emotional maturity that how can they, they can take i think five six could be for some children maybe seven or eight for, for others it really depends on the child i would say um and if they're very little i would take it very easy and very very gently and and um start with a lot of sort of oral um and sort of by heart playing or imitation and um perhaps not straight away with music notation let them experiment with with the instrument the possibilities of it um and i think the children are the having great imaginations and that perhaps their sort of um ability to focus and for longer periods and grows from there i've, I've got another question actually they're, they're flying in at the moment um this is a gosh an interesting question might might be a long-winded answer okay can, can you name three pros and three cons about the recorder about playing the recorder well yes i think um funny enough one of the the pros is also a con and in which that it's quite an inexpensive instrument to start with for instance the reason and i'll, I'll explain this the reason one starts learning the desk and or the soprano recorder as children it's purely this is a lovely um, plastic yamaha desk and um it's purely because it fits little fingers better you see and these can be mass produced and they are these are made out of plastic which is also cheap and inexpensive to manufacture so they're widely available of course they range in quality and i would be very very wary of buying them as packs in supermarkets or see-through recorders i'll be very although they look really appealing because they're funky colors and um and they, they're cheap be careful with with um how inexpensive they are because very often they are they don't do you any justice and they make the image of the instrument worth but that's a pro but the con is just that is that it can be seen as um as sort of a cheap sort of you know instrument for children that, that they will then do for a bit and then move on to a proper to a proper instrument now another pro is um that you learn so much about history you get to play this incredible array of instruments um the con the other side of that is that you have to um really be interested and um really want to find out about it and it's not that it's desperately time consuming but with any instrument you've got to put in the work little and often um and yeah so that's another third one let me think i, I mean i'm just thinking of the, the the huge versatility just looking at the sheer number of instruments you have there oh, yes. i mean most if you're a string player you play you know if you're a violinist you play violin and possibly viola as well if you're a cellist you play cello if you're a Baroque cellist, you might play viola de gamba as well, but you don't tend to be able to master that many different instruments. Now, and it means that your brain, I like to say, because <laughs> your brain is growing all the time because you really do, it really makes you expand your reading ability and oral ability. Now, if you've got such a thing as perfect pitch, this is going to be, because perfect, perfect pitch is actually a neurological disorder. Um, is when things get fixed and that's that's a difficult thing is that it's rare enough that it's prevalent enough now i don't have perfect pitch what i do have is very good um relative um so i'm able to sing different pitches on cue but in different um tunings different temperaments different pitches a baroque pitch and maybe we'll come to it to pitches and temperaments at some point because all these instruments are different temperaments as well there's one massive pro i can think of is that the portability of them i mean i know when you're carrying a lot i see you arrive for, for rehearsals and for work with us and you've got your lovely big recorder bag yeah, but it, yeah, it's yeah. not quite as cumbersome as lugging a cello around oh most certainly it's really really actually that's a really good point you kind of forget when you're player um that you know I, i'm not harpsichordist so i don't have to worry about it you always play your own instrument you don't have to rely on somebody else's instrument you must be terrifying <laughs> Um, so that is, uh, yeah, of course, and just the breadth um, of repertoire that you can tune into, um, I, it's, it's wonderful. I think it's just, uh, I can't really think of any cons other than the, the, the image, but we, you've, you, you've addressed that and I, um, I hope over the coming um, 
two sessions on the 8th and 22nd of, of August, you'll join us again and, and hear Lisette play more of this wonderful repertoire. Um, I, got, sorry, Tati, if you've got requests for Baroque pieces for early, just let me know. See if I can. <laughs> just let us know. And that'd be, we're very happy to take questions. And um, I don't think there are any more for today. So it just remains for me to, to thank you, Lisette, for, for such a wonderful presentation. And uh, basically, it's, it's an appetite wetter because I think when you see that many wonderful instruments, you, you can't fail to want to come back for more, to learn more about them. I'd also like to thank, as Lisette said, the Arts Council for funding this project, the Brook Street Band at Home. All our sessions are available afterwards, um, so you can watch bits again. I know there have been a couple of internet glitches, but I think we covered the, um, the, the, the name of the maker that, that, that was missed out at that point. Um, and I look forward to seeing you next week with Catherine Parry back with the violin um, and uh, possibly cello as well next week. Um, and as Lisette said, do tune in tomorrow at 11 o'clock on our YouTube channel where you can hear Lisette's beautiful rendition of four Telemann Fantasias, which will go live around 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. So make a cup of coffee, sit down and enjoy. Thank you so much, Lisette. Pleasure. Really is. Anytime. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye-bye.